Yeah. Okay. So today I wanted to talk about percolation theory, which is a sort of interesting topic that comes out of thinking about probability theory. It shows up in the study of dynamical systems, and it also shows up a lot in statistical uh, mechanics. Now, this is a topic which is actually quite old when you go down to the, the history, because this is something that was around at least since the 60s in the form of physics, and then people really tried to rigorously understand what was going on. And in the 80s, there was a lot of progress on this, and even now it's still an active area of research. But like the books that I had to get from the library to sort of study this thing are literally older than me. So in some sense, it's kind of a mathematically ancient subject. But I think that comes from the sort of simplicity of the problem, and that's why I want to spend some time to talk about it today and express why I think it's kind of a fun thing to think about. So as motivation for this problem, I want you guys to imagine that you have some sort of infinite random forest, okay? And you're going to organize this forest on a giant chessboard, and for each square of the chessboard, you will or will not have a tree. So if I color in black here, there's no tree. Green represents a tree. And since we're going to care about the connected components of this sort of random assembly that you have, I've colored in each connected component consistently with one color. And so now the question is, if some villain comes into the forest and decides to light a fire, how big can a forest fire get in this type of model system? So here's one such example where now I've come here, I just like a lighter, and I've ignited up this whole um, cluster that I have. And the point of percolation theory is to ask questions about what are the probabilistic properties of these clusters? How big can they get? How wide can they get across in space? Um, you can ask questions about their Euler characteristic and topology, but because we're working in the plane, this is kind of simple. And a lot of percolation models also take place on graphs, so things like Euler characteristic aren't so interesting, but they at least give you a way to talk about how many holes I have and stuff like this. So this is how we model the system. Our infinite chessboard becomes a lattice, and each square corresponds to a particular random variable. So this random variable, you can imagine as sort of a random binary function defined over the uh, lattice. So each square in the lattice is open with probability p. So probability p that there's a white square, otherwise 1 minus p there's a probability there's a black square. And of course we're going to identify uh, adjacent squares at least um, up, down, left, and right, not on the diagonals. We're going to identify them to be the same connected component. So for p equal to 0 0.5, it looks something like this. Um, but because we're interested in the connected components, it's really useful to color these pictures and get a sense of what these clusters actually look like, because I find this to be, uh, firstly, more fun to look at, but also easier to sort of understand than this. The black and white picture is more probabilistically correct, but it's also harder to think about what sort of the shapes of these clusters actually look like. So now, um, just so you know where the name comes from, percolation is a process in physics where you try to have a liquid move through some kind of filter. So like a percolation coffee field <coughs> coffee machine is just like a drip coffee machine. And it gets its name because I have a filter, I put coffee grounds in it, and now I pour water on top, and the water has to find a way to move through the coffee grounds and actually get to the bottom of the thing. In the same way, the coffee grounds are um, random squares that are blocking the motion of water, and the fundamental question of percolation is, can I find a path through this sort of random array that will actually get me from top to bottom? And this this uh, sort of physical intuition based off of water corresponds to the forest fire. Because in the same way that um, the forest fire is talking about one connected component, percolation is also talking about a connected component. Do I have some way to navigate through this random field? Um, in particular, um, a lot of the interesting questions about percolation theory revolve around the asymptotics here. 
So this is a finite grid. I think this is like um, 30 pixels by 90 or something. But the interesting questions arise when you consider the infinite grid. So if I give you infinitely uh, enough space, am I going to be guaranteed to have percolation? That is, an infinite cluster that goes infinitely high and infinitely low and everything is topologically connected. Wait, only infinitely high and low, but not the width? What about the width? Uh, you have completely the same type of um, properties. It's sort of the same analysis. But usually, I think people are interested in defining it um, with a certain direction in mind. You can talk about like sort of a bi-directional percolation, uh, and I think the analysis works out similarly, but the traditional case is to consider one direction of motion. So it's irrelevant as in like the theory is agnostic to the width. Yeah, the, the theory is very much agnostic to the width, because especially in the um, process that I'm using to define this, it's completely um, sort of rotation invariant. I can flip the row and column coordinates and get exactly the same model. So all of the statistics end up to be the same. So these are some of the main questions that you get when you open up a book on this topic. People want to know how big can these clusters get, what is sort of their size and expected value, or is there a possibility of having infinite size clusters? Uh, secondly, you want to know how this depends on the parameter p, because we said that um, we're picking the probability parameter, uh, so we want to actually know how this choice of parameter will change what the expected behavior is going to be. And finally, we want to know what the probability is of percolation, the probability that we have this infinite cluster that goes infinitely high and low. So, the first thing to address is to intuitively understand what this parameter p is doing. So the parameter p gives you a probability of having an open square, which I'm depicting by white here. So when p is very small, it looks like you have a black piece of red and I put a bunch of salt on it. When p is 0.5, there's equal distribution of black and white. And when p is very big, of course, <coughs> you get mostly white and not so much um, black. But the interesting thing about this uh, is more apparent when you look at sort of colors on this picture, because now, in the very small case, everybody is sort of disconnected from each other, so they're all doing different things. But in the high probability case, you can see everybody is connected together in this kind of topology. It's a very high genus um, type of thing. There's a lot of hollows here, um, which is, Something that people actually care about in like medical imaging and stuff like this. Um, but for percolation, that's not so interesting how many holes there are. Wait, is there like a boundary probability? Like, do you know like random graphs, for example, like uh, when the well, when the connectedness there is a boundary, and after that there is a one very large connected component and the other very small ones. But before that, it's a completely different picture. That what's happening here? Yes. So this is actually exactly the point of this talk, and um, we'll we'll get to this. So uh, somewhere in between, you see sort of kind of balkanized behavior now, where you see some very small clusters and some quite large clusters, uh, and they're all just intermingled, doing interesting things. And uh, we'll come back to the probability 0.5 case, because this turns out to be sort of the most interesting situation to think about. So now, I want to define a function uh, called the percolation function, this function theta p. This is going to be the probability that uh, the origin is connected to infinity. And so, um, this is where I believe I have to start drawing pictures, but Sort of the idea is that if I have um, the origin somewhere in this grid, then what is the chance that I can just follow a path here and keep on moving out infinitely far? In sort of this picture, in this picture, it's clear I can't really do that so well. 
because even if I start here, it seems like every cluster is sort of finite in how far it can go. But in this case, it's clear I can go pretty far. And the farther you go, the more probability that you can go farther uh, there is. Sort of the bigger the cluster gets, the higher the probability that the cluster can heal go even further. Because um, you just are kind of merging the clusters together as you keep going. So this is what the uh, percolation function actually looks like. And you can see it actually has some distinct behavior here. Below 0.5, the function is strictly zero, meaning that there is completely no probability that um, my origin is connected to infinity with an open path. But above 0 0.5, the probability begins to steadily increase. Now, in other words, this means that infinite clusters are impossible for p lower than 0.5 because uh, the whole problem is sort of translation invariant. If I take this distribution that I'm studying and I translate all the points around in this lattice, the, the group action there does not at all change the probability distribution. So um, having this thing equal to zero tells you that it's completely impossible that there's any infinite cluster. However, for above this threshold, you notice that it's sort of possible but this is actually sufficient to prove the existence of the cluster. So I want to start by um, getting comfortable with this function a little bit and thinking about some of the properties that it has. So I'm going to open up sort of the floor to do some sort of kind of straightforward exercises. I don't think these are terribly difficult. So given this definition of the percolation function, uh, the first thing that we could try to show is that um, the outcome that the cluster connected to zero is infinite is equivalent to stating that there's a self-avoiding path from zero to infinity. So I know that you just kind of saw this model for the first time, but does anybody have a sense of why this might be true or how you might go about trying to show this? Did you just want to see the slider? No, 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 say that uh, it relates to the population model where you have a few Yeah, precisely. So the idea of introducing this function is that um, this percolation phenomenon in physics, uh, you can make very concrete, rigorous statements about it if you use this as sort of your mechanical tool. So Let's start by trying to show this. So firstly, um, we want to show that either the connected component is infinite, or there is, if and only if there's a self-avoiding path that goes from zero to infinity. So let's imagine our lattice. So at every site on this lattice, um, either the point is open or closed. And so let's just say for the point of argument that this guy is going to be 0. And let's just start saying that randomly some of these vertices are open. So this is visualizing one realization of this random process. So now, we want to show the equivalence between these two uh, statements. So c equal to infinity just means that uh, the connected component of 0 
is almost making like a sort of unboundedness statement about the size of this cluster. So now um, we can sort of uh, rationalize this in the following way. So suppose this cluster is infinitely big. It goes out as far as you could possibly imagine. In this case, um, for any diameter that I try to put on uh, this graph, so let's say that I imagine a big ball about the origin, and it doesn't need to be the Euclidean metric, it can be any norm metric that you want in the space, of course. Um, there's only a finite number of uh, points that live inside this ball. So that is to say that for every diameter d that's greater than zero, there's only finitely many x that live inside d. X such that the norm of X is less than A. As a result, if um, if the connected component containing zero is contained inside a ball uh, about zero is the diameter D, then this tells you that the connected component has to be corresponding. So this tells you that um, if the size of this thing is infinite, then for all d, there exists x sub d uh, with um, diameter bigger than this. So we have that the norm of x d exceeds d, and you also have that x is inside the connected. And maybe it would have helped if I actually drew the, the connected component. Yeah. So we're kind of reasoning about this, this object. And so of course, if you take a sequence of increasing d's, now you have this property where I start with a small ball, Go to a bigger ball, go to a bigger ball, and now by meandering around in the lattice, I have some x1 here, some x2 here, some x3 here, and there's some path through this lattice that I can take, which is all connected by hypothesis and also will get me out here. So now, uh, this tells you that there exists a path uh, from zero to infinity. And the final thing that you would want to do is that you would want to say this is self-avoiding, which just kind of means that it's minimal in some sense. So if I have behavior like this, where my path is crossing over itself, then I'm going to sort of minimize this just by saying, okay, go that way. Don't go through the loop that wasted your time. So this uh, is the justification that infinite cluster implies self-avoiding path. The converse direction is, of course, trivial, because any path which is infinitely long has to have infinitely many pieces. And by hypothesis, this path is contained within C. So, the number of elements in here tells you this is also infinite. So, this is uh, an important lemma to have when you're actually doing proofs in the setting. So, the second thing that's really important to show here is that um, theta of p, this percolation function, 
is a non-decreasing function of p. So again, this is a little bit of torture, just to like ask you guys for a model that you just saw. Um, do you have any intuition for why theta of p would be non-decreasing? I suppose because physically it doesn't make sense that if you would, if you, um, if you could, um, if you could increase the probability of it being open and decrease the pro it's not very rigorous, I know, and decrease the probability of there being an open path. So this is exactly the intuition, and I'm going to show you the way to make that rigorous. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to think about how you would actually generate um, samples from this random process. So in the same way that a computer makes random processes or makes random numbers by rolling dice and then doing something with that result, we're going to do something analogous here. So First, let's start with another random process, which uh, is a random function from z squared to 0. And I'm going to call it u. u has the property that for any uh, points in the lattice that I take, it is sampled from the uniform distribution over the unit interval. And all of these guys are independent. So what that means is for every point in the lattice, I'm just going to pick a number between 0 and 1 completely at random. So now, uh, you can use this to define, uh, I don't think I gave a notation. Yeah, you can use this to define this type of grid by a sort of thresholding argument. Or it's called an excursion <coughs> set in other fields. So I already used x. Uh, what do I call it, this thing? This is percolation. Get, give me a, your favorite letter. Like yeah. N. Hmm? N. N, OK. So n of x is now just defined to be 1 if u of x is, I think, greater than p? No, it's less than p. Yeah, because now p is the proportion of shares. And 0 of x. So if you want to generate this process on a computer, this is exactly how you would do it. Where you would take your just uniform random matrix, and then you would threshold it. So this is all sort of uh, straightforward. But this is also the key to proving that this function is not decreasing. So if you have two values of p, p prime and n p double prime. You're doing the same thresholding operation um, with u. However, uh, you can show that if p prime is less than or equal to p double prime, then sort of the probability of each nx is also bounded in a certain way. But also, from this, the way that you have generated this process, for every realization here, uh, you get one realization of this and one realization of this. If p double prime is bigger, then anything that's connected here will be connected here from the way that you defined this threshold. So this is kind of like if I sampled these numbers by going here's 0, here's 1, and here's a sort of strip of the lattice. And here's some random samples. Uh, the first threshold 
is here, and the second threshold is here. And what you immediately see is that uh, n p prime sort of equal to one tells you that n p double prime is going to be equal to one because of this sort of increasing property and how the threshold works. As a result, this tells you that for any realization of this process that you give me, any random grid of and any random infinite function from z squared to 0, 1. If I generate a random matrix here and here using different thresholds, any connected component here is going to be a connected component here. Therefore, um, this probability of having an infinite cluster is going to be infinite, because any infinite cluster here is going to become an infinite cluster here. The last exercise that I have here is to show that this probability is strictly less than 1 for any probability that's less than 1. So this is another thing that I think is a little bit um, straightforward to show. So does anybody want to spitball an answer for this? Yeah. You just take the, <clears throat> the probability that uh, you just have all uh, closed squares around 0. Exactly. So if this is my origin, then all you need to do is consider what's the chance that this, this, uh, this, and this are all zero. And of course, this happens with probability of being closed, which is 1 minus p. And there's four such squares. So you have um, 1 minus p to the 4. In turn, what this tells you is that if I actually write down uh, Theta p. theta p is equal to the probability of having this infinite cluster. And this thing is strictly upper bounded by 1 minus 1 minus p to the 4. So you could have this thing. So this thing would stop the infinite cluster. So you need the chance of this not happening. So this is the chance of this event not happening. But there's other ways that it could happen. So this is a sort of strictly just an upper bound. This is not equal. Um, but of course, this thing is also upper bounded by 1 for any p that's not there. So you have this result that theta p is always smaller than unity. So now, there's a couple more things that I think are a bit less trivial to prove. Um, but nonetheless, I think they form sort of interesting um, sort of material to talk about. So I'm going to move over here because I know I have just notes for this. This is all the stuff that I was going to do with slides, by the way. I remember that the theme that was writing across, like, you are supposed to does a coloring bee nodes with life and dead and the branching process and a like a recurrence equation and then take like a limit of that kind of thing? Uh, it's a bit more straightforward than that. So the way that you would do this is uh, as follows. So we want to show that P less than third implies theta p is strictly zero. So the way that we do this is to find fn to be the event that uh, there exists a self-reporting path of length n, so it's zero. So there exists a self-reporting path Zero um, to you know wherever of length n. So now uh, we just have to think about what properties this path could possibly have. 
So for any path, gamma, the probability uh, that this path is open is just the probability that for all of the squares in the path, that these are all white. So naturally, this is just the uh, number of elements in the path over They're all independent, so it's really that easy to compute. And now you just need to have a notion of how many possible paths there are. So a generous way to upper bound this is to um, try to start counting them. And to count them in the laziest possible way. So first, we start at zero. And there's four different ways that we could possibly go. You can go up, down, left, or right. So now we make our move. And our next move, we need to be self-avoiding, so we can either go up, right, or down. And by symmetry, it's the same number of options no matter where I ended up. So you have three now. And if I make another move, then you notice that it's the same situation. I can either go right, left, or right. So what you realize uh, fairly quickly is that the number of possible paths is strictly less than or equal to four times 3 to the n minus 1. This is a generous upper bound of how many possible paths you can have. As a result, these two pieces of information tell you that the probability, given this parameter p, that uh, this event occurs is strictly upper bounded by 4 e to the n, 3 to the n minus 1 on the y curve right to the n. And so now, for a p sufficiently small, you can send this limit to 0. In particular, if uh, p is less than 1 third, then this thing tends to 0. The chances that you can have this path, which is extending from the origin to infinity, uh, is absolutely zero for sufficiently small p. So you know that this theta function has to start at zero. So the other thing to prove is that this thing actually comes up and goes to one which is uh, a sort of related approach. But we have to introduce another piece of machinery. Specifically, uh, from graph theory, we have a notion of a dual graph. So here, I'm going to start drawing out my Z2 lattice again. And now I want to consider what the graph theoretic dual of this lattice is, which is just uh, a new graph where each face becomes a vertex. And now the edges connect the, ver the vertices in the same sort of arrangement that the edges connect with the original vertices. And you can show that this thing is well defined using some typical combinatorial arguments. So this is our graph, the Z2 dual. So now, as a lemma, 
you need to understand that um, you have a finite cluster if and only if you have a cycle in the dual graph. So certainly by drawing pictures, you can get a sense that this is true. If I come here and I start drawing squares, then you'll see a boundary in the dual graph. And by definition, there's going to be no crossing. Because if there was a point here, then um, this cycle in the dual graph is not is not defined. Okay, specifically, it's a it's a path on the, the edges of the dual graph. But it's the same kind of argument. Another way to see that is to actually look at what realizations of this process look like. And for any cluster that you have in these pictures, you notice that every cluster has a black outline, which indicates to me that every cluster that I take has a cycle in the dual graph. Because essentially, um, this cluster is defined by the fact that it's not connected to anything else other than points within the cluster. So now, if I try to uh, imagine what that looks like in the dual graph, you have barred off everything that's not on this island. So now, the argument that this thing should go to um, infinity, or sorry, the, the argument that, um, I need to bring up the slide again. The argument that the theta function tends to unity, as p tends to unity, just results from the same argument that we use to say that p sufficiently small should tend to zero. You have that um, the probability of this not happening in the dual graph um, also tends to zero. Because a generous sort of upper bound on the probability <coughs> is they don't personally have uh, written out. But the probability of having a finite cluster, um, or zero being a finite connected component, is sort of generously upper bounded by this infinite summation, which has some obnoxious form. Where what this is doing is that this is enumerating <coughs> the probability of having all of these closed cycles. So this is telling you something about how many possible ways I could have closed cycles in the dual graph. It comes from the same sort of counting arguments that I used to generate uh, this upper bound. But now, when I'm doing it here, you notice that even though I have an infinite summation, it still depends on uh, 1 minus p. And as p tends to uh, unity, this tells you that 1 minus p tends to 0. And you can make this geometric series sort of decay as fast as you want. So um, specifically, it's convergent for big 1 minus p, or for small 1 minus p's. Um, but if you go sufficiently small, then this thing can be, can be finite. So, in particular, what you can do is that um, as you take this limit, you can end up with a situation that this is less than 1, which tells you inversely that the probability of this not happening is positive. Uh, and specifically, because that's theta p, so this thing is equal to 1 minus theta p. If you can make this thing arbitrarily small, then you can make this arbitrarily close to 1. So now we know some properties of the theta function. 
We know that it has to be zero below some threshold. We know that it sort of eventually has to tend to one. And it's like not very trivial to show that this thing is continuous, so you're just going to have to trust me that it is continuous. But so now, the question is, how do you actually switch between these two regimes of behavior? So, in particular, if I define some PC to be the uh, supremum over P, such that theta P is equal to zero, Uh, then you want to be able to tell me something about what this PC actually is. So, okay, well, I forgot to put the slide in here. Sorry, is it obviously strictly positive, or increasing? It is non-decreasing, is, is what we showed previously. Continuity, because it's not trivial to show, is I'm going to omit it. But because it tends to one and it's continuous, it has to eventually come up somewhere. So, okay, now I want to, I want to talk about why this thing being non-zero matters. So, the fact that theta p is positive means that almost surely there's an infinite cluster. Of course, with probability zero, everything could be zero. And this is like a legal outcome, but it's not probabilistically likely to happen. So we have to say almost surely, meaning with probability one, there is uh, an infinite cluster. This I also did not get to prepare. Uh, but the way that you sort of motivate this proof is by using the Kamalgarov 0, 1 law. So the Kamalgarov 0, 1 law says that if you give me some sort of asymptotic statement about probability, and you talk about, uh, you know, I have this sequence of events, and I want to talk about the asymptote of this sequence of events, um, the probability of the thing either being true or false is either 0 or 1. And the reason that this is relevant here is because you use translation invariance to actually make this argument. So here on this lattice, I have some situation that I've drawn up. And if you assume that theta p is positive, there's some probability that I have an infinite cluster. But there's also a probability 1 minus theta that this is not in the infinite cluster. But if I slide this picture over, well, now I have to talk about the probability of this not having an infinite cluster and this not having an infinite cluster. And you could say, talk about them jointly. And then you could talk about these three not having, and these four, and you can continue growing the sequence. As you grow the sequence, the Kamalgarov 0, 1 law becomes applicable, because now you're talking about, as I look at the asymptotic behavior of anything on this vertical line, on this horizontal line, uh, the probability that nothing on this line is in the infinite cluster is going to tend to zero. So this is sort of a sketch of how you actually prove this. And sort of the intuition is also kind of, uh, for me, given in this picture, where even if somewhere in between I don't really have points that will take me to infinity, um, Eventually, if I keep going, the probability states that I will find such points. I'm also realizing I didn't tell you guys what this picture is. Um, so this picture is the same thing as the pictures I was showing before, but um, just to highlight the structure of these clusters, I picked random clusters here and I kept their colors and then I pushed all the guys to be blue. So that's why like these pictures look kind of similar, but like not quite. Um, just isolating the behavior of some specific clusters to look at. Because at least for me, this psychologically lets me understand what I'm looking at better. Okay. So this critical 
um, parameter, this PC, is an example of uh, what physicists like to think of as a phase transition. So for P, values of P below the critical point and above the critical point, you have different behavior. Below, you have no infinite clusters. This function is zero. Um, if you compute the expected value of the size of a cluster, it happens to be finite. On the other hand, uh, for, for the supercritical phase, for P's bigger than this cutoff, you have definite, um, it's definitely going to be true that there's going to be no infinite cluster. This probability function is going to be positive, and the average cluster size is going to be infinite, because almost surely you're always going to have an infinite cluster. So these two regimes of behavior are very distinct. In one case you have percolation, and in the other case you don't have percolation. And so in statistical physics, this is really reminiscent of how um, they like to model phase transitions, where below a certain, above a certain temperature, you have one regime of behavior, and below the other temperature, you have a different regime of um, behavior. And so now, just to kind of close off this talk, I want to talk about something that's interesting that happens at the critical point, um, which for z squared happens to be 0 0.5. And this is also a non-trivial proof that um, I'm going to spare you guys, because this is like several pages of a GTM. Um, several pages of? This, actually this isn't a GTM, it's just a yellow one. But it's like several pages of the Bible on this topic, which is Percolation by Jeffrey Grimmett. If you guys have read Grimmett and Storzacher, it's the same guy. At least I think. I'm like 90% sure. I mean, I, I just think another book called Alan Spencer, Probabilistic to Methods, they mentioned about that graph here, right? They, they didn't use the word percolation, but yeah, I think it's probably the same as you were talking about. Well, so a lot of these models happen to be related, and this is an aside. A lot of these models are related because they're sort of statements about random fields of probability. And in particular, you have some sort of geometry to the space where you're talking about things that are either topologically connected together in a graph, or things that are geometrically or metrically related by being close in space. What about ZN? Yeah, so um, this is also good to mention. Um, for n equal to 3, the threshold is kind of unknown. There's a lot of things they don't know about this uh, space. But it turns out that for n bigger than, I think, 18, the, tri the theory becomes trivial again. Um, I don't remember the exact statements, but it turns out to be very easy to analyze 18-dimensional integer lattices for percolation models. Yeah, I know. I, I would have to go back to kindergarten to remember why that is. <laughs> um, but the stuff always has like very weird statements that are always like on just another page in the book. So when you're at the, uh, the threshold, um, the model demonstrates even stranger behavior, uh, like scale invariance, which is sort of kind of characteristic in statistical physics. Like any time that you see people talk about phase transitions, they start talking about universality and scale invariance, which are all just related to the idea that um, if you sort of vary the scale of the space by scaling up and down all of your coordinates, um, some property will change in a predictable way, usually according to some exponent gamma. And this is uh, sort of the definition of a power law relationship, that if I change x by a factor, then it's also going to be homogeneous with some degree gamma. So, uh, not that I have much time to talk about it, but what that means in the percolation setting is that the statistics kind of change, Can, or the, the, the statistics do not change as you scale up the space. So um, this transformation that I'm doing here is called a renormalization transformation, or it's the renormalization group 
I don't really know why they call it a group. I haven't seen any evidence to believe that this is actually a group other than scaling the coordinates being a group. But for like lattice models on Z, it's not really like a group operation because I'm going to be amalgamating uh, points. So just to give you a sense of what's happening here, I want to study the space as I change the scale of the problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my integer lattice. And I'm going to have some of these guys uh, be uh, randomly flipped on and off. And so now, for this renormalization transformation, I'm going to start grouping together uh, clusters of nodes. So every four points, at least for the visualization that I'm showing, I group together. And you're going to map it now to a new grid where uh, these guys are going to be Yeah, this is where these guys are going to be open if you have a vertical percolation in each subgrid here, and they're going to be closed if there is no such percolation. So, percolation here just means that I can go from top to bottom with a connected component. And so, now when P is exactly at the critical threshold, you have that, this strange behavior where the statistics remain unchanged when you actually do these renormalization operations. And this displays that the system has sort of a scaling variant behavior. Um, I mentioned something about power laws, and these are things that show up, especially when you try to approximate things like the theta function or like the size of a cluster as a function of p. Um, the approximation by a power law gets like very good as you zoom in. Um, and this shows up like all the time in statistical physics for reasons that I don't even really feel qualified to talk about. Um, it shows up sometimes in chaos theory that people talk about um, not like specifically percolation, but percolation like things, especially as you like talk about sampling and there's this one paper that came out like two weeks ago about you have a, an attractor and you're moving around the attractor and making a graph based off of what points are nearby. And they do all sorts of like weird stuff. Um, and it also shows up surprisingly in neuroscience, where um, this sort of like phase, phase transition uh, hypothesis shows up as a sort of hypothesis of how certain neural phenomena uh, are described. One such thing is like consciousness, which is like consciousness is a phase transition from being unconscious to conscious and this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but this is something that you can see people in Quora talk about. So I think it's interesting to mention at least. All right, and with that, I'd like to conclude this talk.